we're going to run out of time before uh, the announcements are over, but I want you to look up on the board. Just let me get to your slide and uh, blend. Hope I don't go through it. Thinking maybe I can get uh, right here. No, no. There you go. Isn't that pretty? That was. Uh, that's actually the. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of rain, but that's the a waterfall right behind the building, just just a quarter mile away. So, so I thought I would uh, put it up there because it's such a pretty pretty sight to see. Uh, in fact, y'all might be interested. So, if some of y'all have visited there before, we're in Acts 22, so we'll begin just in going. there a few weeks. <laughs> it's pretty pretty cool. Again, we are in Acts chapter 22, continuing our survey of Luke and Acts, nearing the end of our, our study of the book of Acts. We're kind of in the final stages as to what happens with the Apostle Paul. He takes up the uh, the last half of the book primarily as the as the leading figure uh, character in the book, uh, looking now at his defense to the Jews uh, in Acts the twenty second chapter after he was arrested in the temple in the twenty first that we discussed last week. So Acts twenty two is where we'll begin in just a few moments. If you will bow your heads, we'll start our class together with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you at this time, and we are so grateful that you are our God, so grateful for our, uh, our opportunities, especially every Lord's Day, to, to come before you and to worship you and to praise your name, to give you our thanksgiving and, and to, in the praises that we offer to give you the full credit for who you are and what you have done for us, both as our Creator your Son is our Savior, the scheme of redemption that you had in your mind since before the beginning of the world. So grateful for all of these things and grateful for the opportunity to study each Lord's Day and, in fact, every day to learn more about you and your will for us. So, Father, it is our prayer that as we engage in this study today that we'll be mindful of, of how much we do indeed owe you and what it means to be a child of God. We ask forgiveness and as we falter from time to time, we ask that you give us wisdom and as well as the guidance from your word that we might uh, act and, and, and walk in an acceptable way that brings you glory. And dear Father, we pray your blessings not only upon this class, but the worship that we offer today, that everything that we do will please you, will bring glory to your name, and be a sweet savor that is acceptable in your nostrils. Uh, we pray all of these things in your blessed son's name. Amen. Okay, as always, we'll begin with the previous um, chapter and reviewing it, and basically what we talked about in our study last week as we uh, noted that uh, Paul determined to continue his, his journey to Jerusalem despite the fact that there had been warnings given to him uh, as well as many Christians that he came across as he was traveling back to Jerusalem that he would, through that prophecy, that he would suffer. He he determined that he would be not only willing to be bound, but to go even beyond that because the warnings were not about his death, but rather about his suffering. But he was willing even to die, we are told, uh, for Jesus. And so he came to Jerusalem as, uh, as he wanted to do. He had to, to, uh, uh, to make shorter some of his, his uh, uh, interactions with, with other individuals to get there before the feast season. You'll remember that he did not go back through Ephesus, but instead met the Ephesian elders in Miletus, as indicated in Acts chapter 20. Uh, he went to Troas uh, as well and, and other places on the way back, but he ended up in Jerusalem, and we're told in the second point that Paul did as the Jewish brethren there, the believing leaders of the church uh, there in Jerusalem, wanted him to do to uh, basically ingratiate himself uh, to the Jewish believers, those who believed but had heard insincere things, uh, uh, heard 
malicious things about, about Paul, that he had not, uh, he basically wanted to completely do away with the law, and that he was unwilling to, to uh, accept the culture of his time, which was as a Jew, uh, as the tribe of, of Benjamin. He was an individual who was very much steeped in the knowledge and understanding of what the law was, but because he was teaching that the Gentile did not have to be circumcised, they, they thought that he was basically just denying his Jewishness and teaching things that were not true about, about the Jewish faith and about the uh, keeping of uh, the, the cultural practices of the Jews uh, even after the new way had come, which of course was not true. So he followed the advice of the brethren. He went into the temple. He showed his enemies that he had not forsaken the the law, which was their national law, and uh, as a result of that, a couple of false accusations were raised. But the primary one, uh, he answered some of the accusations that other had. But but the non-believing Jews likewise uh, thought him to be a blasphemer and ungodly man because they didn't make the distinction at all between the old covenant and the new covenant. They didn't believe the new covenant at all, and they actually thought that. Paul had brought a Gentile. He had been with a Gentile earlier in the week, and they thought he had brought him into the temple and desecrated or defiled it. Even to this day, there are places where, where Gentiles, or in this case, those who are not Christians or those who are not Jews, cannot go in Jerusalem as a result of the fact that they are parts of another religion. It is considered uh, unlawful in the Jewish nation for them to do such a thing. They thought that's what Paul had done, so... So they basically formated a mob or formed a mob, enraged that mob, and, and the authorities had to come in. The, the Roman authorities, the centurion, a garrison, uh, for the purpose of not only protecting Paul, but getting him from the people, and they arrested Paul. And uh, that's where we basically get to is chapter 22, because now Paul actually asks uh, for permission. Notice verse, uh, verse 39. Uh, after telling the uh, centurion about this, he said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, the mob was, was basically made up of Jews. The Romans' positions and parts here were, were to basically control the populace uh, as they were in, uh, in Judea. So the soldier allowed him uh, permission, and... Um, and as, as he gave him permission in verse 40, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And there was a great silence, and then he spoke to them, we're told, in the Hebrew language. Now, speaking in the Hebrew language would be an indication of respect. Many of them, no doubt, spoke the commerce of the day, the, commerce, the language commerce, which was Greek rather than Hebrew. But he was speaking to fellow Jews, and he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. So we get into chapter 22, and, and looking at the chapter uh, we're going to look at the defense that he gave of himself, which, which actually was not an attempt to, to reason with the mob or to appease the mob at all. It angered them greatly because of what he said about uh, what had happened to him and what had happened with regard to their law. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in our lesson today. So anybody have any comments about chapter 21 before we get into the new material? All right, well, let's start off then in chapter 21 by looking at the first uh, five uh, verses, Paul identifying himself and giving his history as a persecutor uh, of the faith. So, he said, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Uh, and he said, I am indeed a Jew, uh, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward the God, as you all are today. So there might be considered some appeasement in that regard because, first of all, he gives an introduction, but he has a purpose in what he's doing. He says, look, I am a Jew. I have as much right to call myself a Jew as any of you. In fact, in other places, when he made his defense, he said he exceeded other Jews in his zeal while a persecutor of the church. He said here in verse 4, he said, I, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even to those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. 
And, and so this was his purpose in life that we're all aware of. In fact, it is recorded in Acts, the ninth chapter that we've already studied, that these, in fact, uh, were the events which transpired. Now, looking up at the slide, uh, the material that's in the outline, uh, the interesting uh, way in which he describes this as a defense. Uh, the word defense comes from a Greek word meaning an apology. He was making the arguments uh, to show that he was not guilty of the accusations that were made against him. Uh, he could not be guilty of them even if he wasn't keeping the law as the Jews thought that he should because in fact he was keeping the law in a far better way than they were. The law itself prophesied concerning the coming of the Christ, the establishment of this new covenant, the inclusion of the Gentiles into it. Paul was doing what he was supposed to be doing when the rest of these Jews, they act in actuality, were not. So he uses that uh, and states that it is a defense. He honestly recounted that history. Uh, this is another thing that is very interesting. Um, the Bible is, is good about this because the Holy Spirit wrote it instead of men. All of the warts, all of the, the negative things, the heroes, the anti-heroes, the men of faith, the men that are not. When you perceive, for example, uh, some of the lies of Abraham that he told in order to protect himself, uh, what David did with Bathsheba, other individuals who failed, Peter uh, would be a wonderful example. Well, here's another example. Paul was not necessarily a, a good man. Uh, now, he did it ignorantly in unbelief, but he describes himself as an individual who is insolent. And regardless of his motivation behind it, he was actively campaigning against the Christ uh, in, his, in his early life. And so uh, he was indeed a persecutor of Christians. Now, I have made this point many, many times, as this is one of the primary reasons why Paul became an apostle to the Gentiles and an eyewitness of the Christ. You remember in Acts not Acts, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul, after giving the eyewitnesses a list of them that had saw the resurrected Lord, he said he was, he himself was an eyewitness of the Christ, that the Lord had appeared to him as one born out of due time. And, uh, and he was referencing that, that occasion in Acts the ninth chapter when he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. And so here we have the man who was the chief persecutor of Christians, the man who was the greatest enemy of the cause of Christ early in its existence, who became a believer because he saw the evidence personally. He witnessed it. So with the other disciples, we might could say that we don't have to believe their testimony, uh, or at least this is an argument that some would make, that that eyewitness testimony could very well be biased or it could very well be false because these individuals had a reason uh, to claim that he was resurrected from the dead because he was their teacher and he claimed that he was going to be resurrected from the dead. Not so with Paul. And that makes him a very, very strong eyewitness. And his testimony uh, is something that in a court of law today would be considered unassailable. You'll hear that. You'll hear have an eyewitness that will, that will come before uh, a, a, a court. And, and uh, so you have two things. You'll have, let's say it's a, there's a defense attorney who is cross-examining him because his eyewitness testimony is something that is destructive to his case. And so you have the prosecutor that offers the eyewitness, the eyewitness testifies, and what he testifies is accurate. Uh, what he testifies is something that has no inconsistencies and cannot be on the face refuted. And so the next thing you do is you examine their character and you try to impugn their witness that, yes, he's saying this, but he's a friend of the, uh, friend of, of, uh, the defendant, or he's, a, he's an individual who's been influenced by the defendant, or he's cut a deal with the prosecutor. And even in a court of law, often those, those things, if the, if the witness comes across as an honest man, those things are ineffective uh, because it doesn't change his testimony, what it is he's saying. But you cannot impugn in any way. You can't consider the witness of, of Paul to be in any way flawed. He was the enemy. And yet he is testifying uh, on the part or as the part of a friend, as a follower, as a believer, because, because it actually happened and he actually saw that it happened and he actually has that eyewitness testimony that it was the case. And it's a very, very strong testimony that's accepted in just about any court of law. And yet there are many who are unwilling to accept that as any truth or any good truth 
any legitimate proof about the resurrection of the Christ. Just because it happened 2,000 years ago, it had to happen sometime. didn't have it happen in, in, in 2024. It could have happened over 2,000 years ago, and the fact that they did not have social media, and they didn't have TV, and they didn't have Fox News, and those kinds of things doesn't make it any less legitimate. The fact that it didn't happen in your generation or in your time, or you're not the one that witnessed it, doesn't make it any legitimate, any less legitimate, just as any other uh, individual who was convicted or who was released or who was uh, found to be truthful by eyewitness testimony is illegitimate just because you weren't there to see it. In the fullness of times, in the last days, when God determined it was time to do it, he sent his son. And his son died on the cross. His son was resurrected from the dead. And an unimputable, an imputable witness said that that was the case. And it is abundant and strong evidence that this is not a myth at all. And individuals can deny it because why? Because I can't see it because I wasn't there, because it's something that is out of the ordinary, because it is even miraculous, and those things don't happen today, but it doesn't mean anything, because there are eyewitness testimonies who saw it and saw it and saw it. 500 brethren saw him at once, and he appeared to Paul too as one born out of due time. And so we have great strength to indicate that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was valid. Jesus is the Son of God. Christ is our Savior, and we are to follow him as our Lord here on this life on this earth, in our life. That's preaching right there. That's not teaching. So <laughs> I apologize for that. I got a little wound up. But I, I think it's an important application to make with regard to his own recounting of his history. They didn't believe it at that time. They were there. They saw the miracles. They often interacted with individuals who had miraculous powers, and yet they still were unbelievers. It's not because it's not true. It's because they don't want it to be true. And that was the case with the Jews on this occasion. All right, so having said that, anybody have any comments or questions to raise before we get into the next few verses? All right, so let us then go uh, into verses 6 through 11 and note the response of Saul as he talked about uh, not just his conversion. I said his experience on the road which led to his conversion, as we'll see a little bit later. A lot of times people talk about the conversion of Saul on the road um, to Damascus, and that was not actually what happened, and it is evident in Paul's own eyewitness or his own testimony concerning himself. It happened, he said, as I journeyed and came near to Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. I fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they didn't hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which were appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came in uh, to uh, Damascus. Now, um, okay, so... Those two questions will be answered in a minute. Let's just look at a couple of explanations or a couple of points to be made in, in regard to this. First of all, there is specificity with regard to this. Once upon a time is not part of this particular account. He had the day, he had he remembered the day, he had the time of day. It was about noon, as indicated in verse 6. There was a, a, a conversation with what he recognized as a divine being. Understand that, very significant. Um, the Apostle Paul understood because of the nature of God, because of his upbringing as a Jew, that what was happening to him was supernatural. He also understood that this was happening. It was legitimate. It wasn't an aberration. It wasn't a false thing. It was true, which is why, even though he did not believe at this point in time, he sees the great light from heaven, very well made a thought, oh, no, an angel of God is going to speak to me. Who are you, Lord? He did understand his authority. Understand this. The word Lord in this text and in others indicates authority, which again is a good application to be made that, that a lot of people want to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, but very few are willing to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. He has authority. In effect, simply put, you have to do what Jesus says to do because he is Lord. Well, here, Paul, uh, Saul, he didn't know who, who 
the Lord was. It's not a, who are you, Lord, like, oh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm saying this is Jesus because he didn't know it was Jesus. He understood when he said, who are you, Lord, that this was divine. This came from God. He didn't know the identity of who it was that was speaking to him and who was appearing to him, but he did know that he had to do what this one said to do. And then we have the identification where Jesus said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he's the one that Paul was guilty of persecuting. And of course, he was persecuting Jesus. Jesus has already died, but his movement, the way, was being greatly persecuted by Paul. Paul had consented to the death of, of Stephen and, and helped with that, that initial persecution that led to the scattering of the disciples to the, uh, the surrounding region, as Acts chapter 8 indicates. He consented to his death, and Saul himself, as Acts 9 tells us, was doing what he could uh, to persecute these individuals. And so he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And so we see other witnesses to certain events, but this was an appearance to Saul that is mentioned, so only Saul heard what was said. So looking very quickly at what was said, just note that he told him to go into Damascus and there will be told you what you are appointed to do. The question that Paul had asked, or on this occasion again, uh, he was known as Saul, and he said, uh, what would you have me do? Or what shall I do, Lord? Verse 10 of the text. And he was told what he was to do. All things that were appointed for him to do, which basically it's twofold. I've I've stated it a bit differently reading the entire text. There's only one thing he was told he must do, but he, he certainly, secondly, was, was told that he was to preach to the Gentiles. That was a ministry that was given to him, a stewardship, and we are told by Paul himself that unless, uh, unless you are faithful as a steward, you stand condemned before God. It is something that is important. But there's one thing that he was told to do to wash away his sins, wasn't there? And something he had to do to have his sins washed away, as we'll get into verse 16. So... Looking at those things, notice the two questions that we're asking. First of all, how would you characterize the tone of Paul's speech? I'm not sure what I put on that, what my answer was. Okay, well, it was, no, okay. I just wanted to make it know what I said. So well, since no one spoke up right away, we'll just kind of make this note, and you can add to it if you want. It was an apology in the sense that it was a defense, and that's what the word apology from the original Greek indicates, not, oh, I'm sorry that I upset you. That's an apology. That's groveling is what that is. And it's certainly inappropriate when he's giving a defense of his actions because he had absolutely done nothing wrong. And what he was done was not designed just as Jesus' words were never designed and the Apostle Paul, wherever he went, it wasn't designed to mollify. Now, the Apostle Paul always did uh, become a, a Jew to the Jew, a Greek to the Greeks, um, uh, all things to all men that he might by some mean win some never was an what never was it a groveling never was it compromise never was it uh, a compromise of principles just to get something done it was simply he approached it the best way he could uh, in order to be received by a, a a honest and and diligent or sincere heart and he did so here too it's just that these individuals didn't want to hear it uh, so keep that in mind anybody want to add anything to that the second question I know a little bit better. Does Paul's testimony reveal that he was converted on the road to Damascus or in the city? Which one? That's not a hard question. Would you? In the city. Thank you. Well, someone answer me when I ask these questions. Because I talk all the time. And I don't want to do that all the time. I want to a lot, but I don't want to. <laughs> okay. So then again, you'll notice he said, go into Damascus. Uh, at this point in time, he was a believer, certainly, he believed in Jesus, Jesus told him, but there were certain things that he had to do, and I want you to notice in verse 22 of the text, they listened to him until this word, and they raised their voices, said, away with such a follow, and I, I, I apologize, uh, that wasn't intended, verse 22, it was, it was 16, it was chapter 22, verse 16, so that's the appropriate um, verse reference there in the second question, because in verse 16, his sins had not yet been washed away on the road to Damascus, which we'll get to uh, to a greater extent in just a few moments. Okay? Still had to be baptized. All right, so then we get to the next section, which is found in verses 12 through 21, where he recounts the actual conversion. So he went into Damascus. Certain Ananias, who was 
A devout man, according to the law, having good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up him. Now, I just want to note one thing. This does not contradict verse 16. It doesn't even speak about verse 16 of the text. And the fact that Ananias called him brother has absolutely nothing to do with the Christian heritage or the fact, was he a brother in Christ? He was a brother as a, a fellow Jew. And, and that was a reference that Ananias was making to him. As Ananias comes to him, he's coming as one Jew to another, and he calls him brother there in verse 13. So this is not in any way an indication that at that point in time his sins had been washed away because he hadn't done what he needed to do in order to have his sins washed away. So that's just a misreading of verse 13. It is rather typical for individuals who are not very well versed um, in, in these matters. It doesn't indicate at all anything other than their fellow, fellow kinship as Jews. And so he said, notice in verse uh, uh, 12, that Ananias was a devout man according to the law. So at the same hour I looked up at him. So now we have in verse 13 that he received his sight miraculously at the hands of Ananias. He said, receive your sight. It happened to him. And then he said, the God of our fathers, of our fathers, that's the brotherhood, that's the kinship. They were both Jews. He has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth for you will be his witness to all men what you have seen and heard. Why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem. I was praying in the temple. I was in a trance. I saw him saying to me, Make haste to get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning him. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death, guarding the clothes of those who were willing to kill him. So this is where the tide changes. So he says, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. So now he is basically saying the primary reason why the Jews didn't like him. He's saying that, that I am an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. The Lord told me to be a disciple, to go and to teach to individuals what he had seen. These are all men that, uh, that have, have seen this, verse 15 of the text. And of course, we are also uh, indicated very clearly in Scripture that in all men, that's inclusive of the Gentiles. That argument has already been made and discussed and debated uh, and was settled in Acts the 15th chapter. And so you'll notice after it in verse 17, uh, now... He has done what he must do. He has been equipped for his mission. How was he equipped? Well, we are told that, first of all, he became a Christian, didn't he? He became obedient to the gospel. Well, I say first of all, second of all. First of all, he was an eyewitness of the risen Lord. Uh, but the, the eyewitness, eyewitness of the Lord on the road to Damascus was not to make him a Christian. It was to equip him as a witness. I'm talking too fast. It was not to equip him to be a Christian. It was to equip him to be an eyewitness as an apostle was to be. You'll remember in, in Acts, the first chapter, with regard to Matthias, uh, he was one of two chosen to uh, cast lots to determine which would be the one replacing Judas Iscariot. And he had to be an individual who had been with Jesus, not only through his ministry, but who had witnessed him in his resurrected state. Matthias fit the bill. He was qualified to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ so that he could go out and preach the word as an apostle and say, listen, this Jesus who you crucified, God has raised up, and I have become a witness to that. I saw the resurrected Lord. I know that this is the case. Paul could do it now as well because he was an eyewitness of the Lord. Then he gets into Damascus, waits for Ananias to tell him what's going on. And what's going on is you need to be baptized because your sins have not yet been washed away. Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins. This is the start of the new life, as Romans chapter 6 tells us. We are buried by baptism into Christ's death. That as Christ was raised from the dead, we should also walk in newness of life. When we talk about washing away his sins, Acts the second chapter in verse 38 states it a bit differently. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. G 
Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be condemned. Now, being dunked in water would have done Saul of Tarsus no good at all if he had denied that Jesus was the resurrected one. How could he deny it, though? He appeared to him on the road. And so Saul couldn't deny that this was the one, so he was one who believed, and he was baptized to be saved, as, as indicated in Mark chapter 16 and, and verse 16, and Acts 22 and verse 16 as well. So uh, this is what happened in verses 17 through 21. Now really it, it kind of, it kind of uh, makes an application more general. So I did what I was told to do. I went and I, I, I went back to Jerusalem and, and we are told that I was praying in the temple and, and I was in a trance and I saw him saying to me, get out of Jerusalem because they're not going to receive you, uh, receive your testimony concerning me. And they said, and he said, well, I, I know what has happened. I've, I've been guilty of these kinds of things. And then in verse 21, the Lord said, depart, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Oh, boy, Jews wouldn't like that at all, would they? So a couple of things. He's the Messiah. God knew that you wouldn't receive what I had to say to you despite what all I have done in the name of the Jewish faith as an insolent and ignorant man, but he, you're not going to listen to it, are you? So what God told me is go and talk to the Gentiles about it. And we're told in verse 22, as they listen to him and feel this word, and then they raise their voices and say, Away with such a fellow, he is not fit to live. Okay, so answering the question is one that's obvious. I, I've kind of skipped ahead. I didn't write the question as down as I should have when I created the handout. So what's the answer to the fourth question? And my explanations sometimes go over this before the question. Make sure everyone recognizes what, what the answer is. What was Paul's mission? Preach to the Gentiles, or to all men. Of course, he did that, but a special envoy to the Gentiles as an apostle of Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm confused why we're conflating conversion and salvation instead of conversion and repentance. That's a good point in the sense that an individual, except for, I would say, that would it be considered as full conversion if an individual repented but did not follow through with baptism. But if an individual repented truly, he would follow through with baptism. So I think, I think that the word conversion is used typically and has been in history, you know, throughout, throughout all, is uh, when a person converts, that means he becomes a Christian uh, in, in the usage of the term. So, uh, so we know that the Lord in Acts the second chapter um, he added to the church daily such as were being saved. And so in that way, it just becomes maybe synonymous. It's probably a not, you lack specificity, and it may not be as sufficiently yeah, specific. Yes. And so it's not really a conversion of the actual You could say that, and you would confuse an awful lot of people. By saying it. it's not incorrect because it can, the concept of conversion is turning. But let me let me ask this question: If if you say, well, again, if it's true repentance, it leads to other actions. That's, that's legitimate. I understand that distinction. I, what I would say is I would, I would like, first of all, to look at the, like the dictionary definition of conversion because I don't think that's how it's utilized today. Well, that uh, may be it, but we yeah. Yeah, I think I think probably so it, because, again, when you're talking about the history of, of the English language and the translations and all that kind of thing, when we're talking about conversion, for example, if you've got an individual who uh, is in need of prayer and forgiveness, uh, we wouldn't call that conversion again. We would call that repentance and, and restitution or 
or being reconciled with uh, uh, after being in a state of, of being separated from God because of our iniquities, but we wouldn't call it conversion generally. And if you were to use the word conversion in that sense uh, as just a turning, you would confuse an awful lot of people because they would take it to mean, oh, he became a Christian again. Like, in other words, he was an alien sinner again, and they would have problems with that. So I think your definition of, of conversion is legitimate. I just don't know if usage is something that is common enough not to cause problems. Yes, Chris. The, the difference of the two seems to be that it's not uh, conversion as in the same sense. We are excluded in some sense. But like you said, the scripture is clear that our usage is a conversion to God's way and so that the cross is the gospel. The Lord added to the church right. later. So maybe maybe that's a part of it as well. I don't know. Again, I'd have to I'd have to be I'd have to use some, some word studies to know that 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 distinction. But I, I do appreciate you bringing this up the point because do know this. And this is a good application that we can make of Justin's point. There are an awful lot of individuals today that say they were converted at some point in time. It wasn't a, it wasn't a changing. It wasn't a turning at all. And I would say with regard to that, that they say that they were converted, but was the repentance legitimate in those cases? Because there are an awful lot of people who don't, don't intend even. I remember, um, I've, I've used this illustration a number of times, and I forget what her name, but uh, in the row... Uh, v. Wade uh, decision uh, in 1973 that that the woman who is known as Jane Rowe uh, it was she was uh, that was a, an alias at that particular time. She later on, even though she petitioned to receive an abortion at that time, she later on became a pro-life advocate, uh, and so she was famously baptized in the in the backyard pool of some famous uh, uh, charismatic evangelist, an evangelical. And they, they actually interviewed her afterwards and said, you, you say you're a Christian now? Yes. You say you're pro-life now? Yes. Well, you're a lesbian, aren't you? Yes. And they said, well, how can, you, how can you be a Christian and still be a lesbian? And she said, well, I'm not going to compromise that no matter what. In other words, I'm not going to go back against the lesbianism. So that's homosexuality. If you're truly a Christian, you need to give up the homosexuality. But she didn't do that and would not do that. She truly had not repented. What she was doing was something that was different. They said she was converted, but there wasn't that true repentance on, on her part. And so I don't know if I uh, helped any or muddied that up a little bit more. But, but, but true conversion is a turning, certainly. Repentance is referred to as a, as a turning. But you, as you convert, you were something like Paul Saul was, and now you're something else. And as a part of that process, the Lord has a part to play in it. The Lord washed away his sins. The Lord added him to the church as he did others in Acts chapter 2 as it is stated. Okay? Very good. Good discussion. Appreciate it. Yes, Jim. Um, Acts 2.19 uh, Jesus said that Jesus said that Jesus said I was thinking of that same. I couldn't bring it to my mind but that's a, that's a real yeah, good one. Okay, and, and that, that is, that's true, and I want to do a word study as far as the distinction, but do note that in Acts 3 and verse 19, the reference, uh, pre, uh, Peter and John were preaching, or Peter was preaching in, in Solomon's portico, Peter and John were together. Uh, the call, again, at the end of his sermon was to repent, therefore, and be converted. So the repentance is a process of the final conversion. Yeah, Okay, yeah, that would, that, would be, that would be legitimate. And, and that, again, when, when we were saying he was converted, it's, again, a usage, and I may have fallen into that, that uh, habit of doing that, is that um, it wasn't until he was in Damascus that his conversion was complete, which contradicts the idea that he became a Christian on the road to Damascus. The process did indeed begin there because he became a believer in the Christ. And he became penitent as well because we're told that he was uh, fasting 
and praying while he was in, 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 in um, Damascus until six times a day and I was chained. So the sins were not washed away. The conversion was not complete until verse 16. Okay, good. Very good. I'm going to have to be a little more careful the way I bring that up these days. Uh, okay, now we get to verses 22 through 30. And uh, just a couple of things to note with regard to this because we don't have an awful lot of time left, but it is something of significance. Uh, we are told again in verse 22 that as they listened to him until this word, then they became upset because he was condemning them in effect uh, by relating his own example of conversion and change. We're told they tore off their clothes, threw dust into the air, and that's when the commander had enough. He wasn't going to willing to have a mob uh, erupt on this. He scourged him, or, he, or excuse me, brought him to be scourged, verse 24 of the text, but as they brought the whip to examine Paul, now these are the Romans on this particular occasion, now Paul, in verse 25, he said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Now the centurion heard that, and we're told in verse 26, he went and told the commander, uh, and he said, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. And then the commander asked, are you? And he said, yes. And the commander said, I purchased my citizenship. Paul said, I was born a citizen, verse 28 of the text. So here was the rule that we're pretty, pretty much familiar with by now. But this is the explicit time when the Apostle Paul uses it. And that is that you could not whip a man if he was a Roman citizen until he was convicted in trial. And then as a part of the punishment, you could. But they saw him as a Jew. And it wasn't until he identified him at himself as a Roman that they reacted the way they did. We're told in verse 29, those who are about to examine him withdrew from him and the commander was afraid. Okay, we've been maybe mistreating this man. We've been dismissing this man as a result of, of him being a Jew. We didn't know he was a Roman citizen as well. Paul utilized this, of course, later on in the uh, process of making his appeal to Caesar. Only Roman citizens could do so. But the guilt or innocence and whether an individual would be released or ultimately punished, if any Roman citizen made the appeal to Caesar, he had the right to go to Caesar for Caesar to hear his appeal. It was a very drastic thing to do because Caesar could tell you anything he wanted to. If he didn't like you, he could, he could put you to death right there. But that's what eventually led uh, Paul to go to Rome where he was in prison where he wrote a number of his epistles, which we'll get into just a, a little bit uh, later on as we get toward the end of the, of, the, of the book. But do keep in mind that it's right here that it became obvious that he was not merely a Jew, and this was not merely a Jewish argument and a Jewish dispute, but rather Paul was also a Roman. Okay? So at what point does Ananias... Uh, reveal concerning what point men are washed away at baptism and what is the significance of the citizenship. No punishment until after being tried. Uh, and so those are the two things you want to note, which we discussed those. I'm answering the questions before I ask them today, but I, I apologize for that. All right, any questions, comments before we draw this to a close? Just a real quick one. Sure. Ah, there you go. There you go. Right, yeah, the, 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 because uh, Tarsus was a Roman, I mean, not a Roman garrison, a uh, chief city in, in that sense, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so uh, it was, again, he was born. It was legitimate, his citizenship as, as a Roman, but it was something that uh, um, because it was spoken in Hebrew in the defense is something. Can you imagine that? Can I speak to the people? Okay, you can speak to the people. He's a Gentile. He probably speaks uh, Greek, he speaks Italian, and this man all of a sudden starts talking in Hebrew. Oh, okay, this is that, it's that dispute that they've gotten, and all of a sudden the people just, oh, they get mad. Okay, let's take him in, let's arrest him. We're going to get this figured out, and one of the ways they're going to figure it out is to beat the Jew to see what the problem was and, and, and uh, examine him through scourging, and uh, that's when it came up that he was a Roman citizen. All right? Uh, so that's, that's the, the, gets to the 30th verse. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, because he still didn't know, uh, he released him from his bonds, commanded the chief priests and their council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. So now in chapter 23, which we'll discuss next week, we see his uh, testimony on that particular occasion. Uh, he also testified to Felix. 
uh, he testified to, um, to Agrippa and, and Festus. Uh, he made his appeal to Caesar, and eventually uh, he went to Rome, where he was finally released because his chains were in Christ rather than anything that he had done. So we'll, we'll talk about that as weeks go on, uh, but we appreciate